Would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? And I'd just like to praise God for the talent that He gives to Sid. But remember, we all have talents, so use them. This is from Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is from God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Sid. I appreciate it. Well, we're continuing our uh, sermon series, Ready for a Change. And today we're going to be talking about uh, decisions. Decisions, decisions. Kind of a a trite title, but indeed uh, we do make a lot of decisions. I think experts say some of us, or most of us, will make uh, thousands of decisions each day which adds up to a billion or so over a lifetime. Let's go in prayer. Holy God, we pray that you open our hearts and minds to uh, your truth and that you speak to us this day. Uh, Where my words are not yours, may only yours be heard. And Lord, as we go forth today, may we go forth to live even more deeply into your love and your call. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. There's an old joke about a country preacher who had a teenage son. And one day while the boy was at school, the preacher decided he was going to give the son a little test. So he got uh, three items, and he went into his son's bedroom and put the three items on the, on the boy's desk. So, so first he put down a, a Bible, and then he put down a silver coin, and then he put down a, a fifth of whiskey. Now he wanted to see which one the boy would pick up when he went to the room. It was his theory that uh, if he picked up the Bible, you know, tucked it under his arm, he would be a preacher like his dad, and if he picked up silver dollar, he would be a businessman. And, well, if he, he, if he picked up the whiskey, the preacher was afraid he would, he would just go bad. So the boy got home from school, and the preacher said hello, and then the preacher kind of tiptoed behind him as the boy made his way back to his uh, bedroom. And kind of stood behind the crack in the door as the boy looked in and looked on his desk, and he could tell he was thinking about it, and, you know, decisions, decisions, right? Well, first, the young man picked up the Bible, and he tucked it under his arm, and then he picked up the silver dollar and put it into his pocket. Then he, he got the whiskey and unscrewed the cap, took a big swig, and the, and the old preacher said, Oh, no, Lord, have mercy. He's going to be a politician. <laughs> now, we don't know how that uh, young man turned out. But uh, someone once said that our decisions are our lives, and there's a, a lot of truth, a lot of truth in that. You know, some decisions are easy, and we uh, make them without too much thought, like uh, Crest or Colgate, or Safeguard or Dove, mayonnaise or mustard. You know, we make those kind of decisions; they don't really have much effect on our on our lives. Uh, others are, are really a lot more important and, and far-reaching. Uh, we have a few graduating seniors, for example, this year in this, in this congregation, and, and they have to decide whether they're going to continue their education or, or whether they're going to go in the military or they're going to get some other kind of employment or maybe you know, whether even to take off for a year and go traveling. And uh, as those of us who are more aged uh, know, they'll have a lot of decisions to uh, follow. Who will they marry? You know, will they have kids? Uh, can they scrape together enough money for that first house? And, you know, decisions, decisions will follow for the rest of their lives, some big and some medium and some small. 
thousands and thousands a day, they say. And, and somewhere in, in all of those decisions, there'll be this very few that, that really shape the, the course of their lives. You know, a good number of us probably studied a poem that Robert Frost uh, wrote, and we probably studied it in, when we were in high school. It's The, the Road Less Traveled. And he, here's what he wrote. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Uh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Some decisions do make all the difference. And Frost wrote of taking the road less traveled by. And uh, Jesus took the road that hadn't been traveled by uh, at all when he was going into Jerusalem at Palm Sunday. And actually, though, the, the biggest decision of his life was not going to be made till early Friday morning. Uh, you know, we, we tend to forget about the human side of, of Jesus. We, we, we tend to forget about the description uh, all the Gospels give us about temptations that came to him, or the time he was angry or grieving, the, the time that he cried. We, we, we tend to forget about that. And, and, and we think today that as he entered Jerusalem that week, he could have done nothing else, you know, other than suffer and die. But if you read the Gospels, they tell us a different, different story. Now, now, the week began wonderfully, you know, as, as we've described today. I mean, it was kind of celebration as he came in. Now, it did begin a little bit humbly. Uh, you know, most uh, people who are, who are celebrities like Jesus was at that time, they'll ride in a town on a white stallion if they're going to be greatly honored. But instead, he came in on a donkey. Mark says it was a colt, but that's putting a you know, lipstick on a pig. He was riding in on this donkey. And, and, of course, the people of Jerusalem, though, they were ready for him because they had heard about the wonder man from Galilee. You know, they had heard about his, his teaching. They heard about his preaching. Uh, they, they heard about uh, his healings. And they heard he was a miracle worker. And as he was coming into town that day, they had big plans for him, big hopes, big dreams. So as, as he rode in, they, they threw cloaks on the ground, and, and the gospel say threw green branches on the ground. You know, we've kind of called them palms, but the, they were green branches that they threw on the ground for him to, to ride over. And, and as he rode over them, they shouted with a lot of hope, uh, filled with hope, brimming with hope. Save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, Hosanna... Uh, in English means save us. Now, they weren't thinking as we might, well, save us from our sin or save us from uh, death. They were thinking save us from the Romans. You know, the, the Romans had invaded Israel and they were running Israel at the time. They were terrorizing Israel at the time. They were taxing them heavily. A number of people had lost their Lands. There, there were people who were roaming around homeless and, and hungry. Anyone who, who, who showed any disagreement with the Roman emperors at all was nailed to a cross. And many of them hung up by a road or something like that. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was a boy in, in Nazareth, it, it, it said that he could go to the top of the hill and look down on one of the main roads. And at one time there were hundreds of crosses that were lining that road. People wanted to be saved from the Romans. And they thought he was the one to do it. Their hope, their, their dream was that he was not only a, a, a healer, he was not only a, a teacher, but that one of his miracles would be driving the Romans out and reinstalling Jewish rule of Israel. Now, uh, unfortunately, 
Jesus had already decided otherwise. You know, there's an old show called Queen for a Day. Some of you might have seen that. It goes back to the 50s, uh, early early 60s. Uh, some of my older friends at New Fountain have told me about that one. Uh, but the Queen for a Day, a deserving woman would be chosen, somebody who, who generally was, was, was poor but noble, and she would be treated like a queen for a day. She would get a tiara and, and a cape and, and, and gifts and, you know, I don't know, maybe a day at a spa or something like that, but she would be treated well. And then, of course, afterwards, though, the, the next day, she would go back to a poor but noble life. But she would be uh, queen for a day. And uh, to those people who were shouting him, uh, that's what Jesus might end up being. You know, he was more Lord of life than the general of an army. He didn't really come to establish the kingdom quite like David did. You know, Jesus came for another kind of kingdom. You might think of it more as a kingdom of the, of the heart, uh, of the soul. He, he wanted qualities like faith and hope and love and peace and forgiveness to reign in his kingdom. So as he rode over the, the palms and the, and the cloaks, the celebration came to an end, and he went on up to the temple. It was getting to be nighttime, so he decided he was going to go back to Bethany, a, few, a town a few miles away from Jerusalem where he had been staying. And he was going to make a lot more decisions uh, after that Sunday evening. Monday he got up and he decided to go back in Jerusalem. He went back to the temple. He saw uh, people exchanging money and selling things in the uh, temple courtyard. You know, people had come from all around the Mediterranean to Jerusalem that week to celebrate Passover. They had different kinds of currency. Money was being exchanged and valued. Of course, a little profit was being made, and others were buying doves and things like that to sacrifice in the in the temple. And well, Jesus got angry. cried out that was the house of the Lord and he knocked over the tables and he knocked over the chairs and he chased them out of the temple courtyard you know as he was doing that he had already developed some enemies and he was picking up more because the, the enemies that day were the well we call them the Pharisees and the Sadducees but they were the the priests the pastors the the lawyers the you know, the religious finger shakers of the day who knew the way of the Lord and they would tell anybody about it. And their way was quite different than Jesus' way. They hated him for his way. And some of them had already decided to, to kill him. And the rest was going to change their mind as the week went on. Monday came to an end, uh, more or less on that hostile note. And Jesus decided to go back into Jerusalem on Tuesday. He confronted the same group of people. They were baiting him, trying to get him to foul up so they could go ahead and kill him. He had great courage. And it takes a lot of courage to stand up against the powers that be when they're fully arrayed uh, against you. They hated him the more for it, of course. Then on Wednesday he went back in, and the, the conflict continued to escalate. They were just going uh, you know, toe to toe, face to face, with each other. Now, now you can imagine the anger uh, of those leaders, the the the, the finger shakers, the uh, the priests, the uh, pastors, the lawyers. Uh, have you ever hated someone? who stood for something totally opposite from your life. I don't know if we've ever had that experience, but what about someone who who challenges your your very being, challenges the way you live? Now, now actually, Jesus does that to all of us. And if you haven't seen that, you're, you're not paying attention. But with those leaders in Jerusalem... You see, if he was right about life, 
and right about God, then they were wrong about life, and they were wrong about God. It, Jesus was challenging how they lived, what they had staked their lives on. So by, by Thursday, when Jesus decided to come in Jerusalem again, they had decided he was a walking dead man. And, and worse, they had recruited one of his disciples to turn against him. You know, a real heinous twist on that. He was going to turn against him with a twist. You know, a lot of decisions were made that week. Our decisions are our lives. Now, the, the plotters against him didn't think they could do this. Uh, they could get get him in, during the sunlight because people were uh, following him. They were still supporting him. They didn't want to cause that kind of trouble. So they decided they were going to take him at night. A actually, as it turned out, in the wee hours of Friday morning. Now, in the hours before that arrest was made, you know, Jesus had had a last supper with his disciples. He had taught them some more things. And then he went out with his disciples to pray at a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed alone, as it turned out. The disciples uh, fell prey to the hour of the night. They fell asleep. They were oblivious to the drama that was playing out uh, around them. But, but here's the most important thing he prayed. Abba. Father. For you, all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. You know, it's almost anticlimactic, almost flat, but biggest decision he had to make, am I going to die? Jesus decided to yield to his Father's will, to follow that. Do you ever seek God's will in the hardest decisions of your life? That's really kind of hard to to do. Most most of us are probably well developed in, in my favorite dodge. I, I might pray for God's will, but it turns out God's will coincides perfectly with mine. It's amazing how often God agrees with me on those things. It, that, but it, suppose you. Pray to know God's will, and it's that you die. That you literally give your life for another. That's, that's a little bit higher status. Or, or suppose just that he asks that you change your life radically, that you go in a different direction in life. Well, that's a... Do you yield? Well, that's what Jesus decided to do. Take this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. He was arrested shortly after that. Judas did come up and give him a kiss so they would know who he was, know who to arrest. And soon he was on trial against the very ones who had plotted against him. Now, out comes a foregone conclusion. But before they convicted him, he was spit on, blindfolded, beaten, tortured. Meanwhile, as that was happening, all of his disciples, of course, had decided to uh, abandon him, to, to, to run away, to, to deny him. They had called him Messiah and, and Son of God at one time, but then this had happened. They no longer called him that. And you can understand they didn't know what to make of this. He had, he had told them this was going to happen three times at least. But they couldn't quite fit it into their minds that this was what was going to happen to him. So they were scared and reeling. Then after the chief priest tortured and convicted him, they, they took him off to Pilate. And the people had heard what was going on. They gathered outside Pilate's window. And at that time, most of them were still with Jesus, apparently. And Pilate took Jesus out before the crowds. And he asked if they wanted him to crucify the king of the Jews. 
Well, I don't think people really know when most of them or all of them decided against Jesus, but maybe it was that moment. They, they looked at him, and there he was, bloodied and bowed and beaten and submitting to Roman control. And the Romans had their fate in his hands, in their hands. But Pilate decided to pass the fate to the Jews. And they made a decision. He's no king. So Pilate asked, what do you want me to do with the king of the Jews? They decided, crucify him. And he asked again. They shouted again, crucify him. You know, all had turned against the Lord of love. The Gospel of Mark says that Pilate then handed him over to be flogged and crucified, and he was. So the man of God who began the week being treated like a king and celebrated and honored as he walked out ended up being abandoned, denied, rejected, and sentenced to death by the very people who had once called him a king. Hmm. Indeed, he was not much more than king for a day to them. The Gospel of Luke says that as he hung there later that evening, he was getting toward dusk, and he was bleeding, you know, and gasping for breath. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, as we begin Holy Week 2014, each of us has to face that, that we always have to decide, each day have to decide where he is in our life. And our question is like, their question, is he more king for a day in your life or lord of your life? Is he at the center of of your life, I'm talking about your ordinary, everyday walking around life at work or with your family, uh, on vacation, in school, wherever you are. Is he at the center of, of your thoughts or actions, words, or even most of them? Or, you know, even a good part of them, even some of them. We make those decisions every, every day. You know, the, the, the truth is, uh, we can put a lot of things at the center of our lives. Food, money, uh, sex, work, sleep, you know, uh, a lot of things can be at the center of our lives. This remains our question. Where is he? It's the same question, more or less, what do you do with this man that Pilate asked the Jews? earlier on Friday. The decision is ours, and we make it each day. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, forgive us those times in our lives, those times each day of our lives, when we ignore, deny, or abandon you, when we let other things be our God and our King, gently or forcefully, when we turn away from you, forgive us and turn us back to you that we may live not just like the crowd did on Friday, but know the glories of your resurrection, your new life, and your claim on ours each day. Amen.